Um, I'm Rosemary McGee, and I'm actually here under false pretenses, as you'll discover as my uh, talk unfolds. I just stepped down from my role as director of the Stuart A. Rose Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library at Emory, where I served for five and a half years. I have been at Emory, however, for 40 years, um, and I am now a research fellow in the humanities. So it was a very wild and wonderful ride, and I'm here to share with you some of my experience that I learned, some of which I learned in other roles, and some in the Rose Library. There we go. So what I'm going to focus on today is this idea of engagement, advocacy, stewardship, and investment, and ways in which many of these wonderful things that we've been talking about can actually come to fruition. And my time in the Rose Library was one of uh, major transformation, both for me, it was a personal and professional transformation, it was also a transformation of uh, the space, initiatives, the staff, and our, our teaching programs as well. These are just some of the many instances of materials that we have in the Rose Library. And here's a photograph of the uh, newly renovated uh, Rose Library that's about two and a half years we've had it. And uh, you'll see it's a very uh, a, a space that encourages transparency, uh, openness. It was previously a set of kind of rabbit warrens and hard to navigate and find each other <coughs> materials. And we opened it, we literally blew it open and the walls are largely glass and that helps both with that sense of openness, which is the philosophy of the archive, but also um, it helps as well with uh, keeping track of your colleagues, security, and seeing what's going on on a daily basis. Um, my hypothesis is that, as already alluded to by many of you, special collection libraries by their very nature offer opportunities for a wide range of engagement and investment, and they provide a true point of distinction for the university. And um, as was noted in the strategic plan here at McGill, and I hope in your institutions as well, you're able to leverage that um, because it's a tremendous resource for the students, faculty, alumni, and community. Um, here are some of the points that I want to make in this talk, and then I'll use some examples from the Rose Library. And that is my recommendation to all of you and all members of your staff to be active, informed, and dedicated citizens of the entire university. In so doing, you'll learn about how the university works, and you'll also learn about how what you're doing fits into that overall work. Serve, as was just mentioned, um, presentation right before this one, serve as a ready resource to those who seek information about history, precedents, core values, and rare materials of any sort. And then seek out members of the government groups, the students, faculty, alumni, boards, and they will serve as partners to you and demonstrate the depth, significance, and ongoing influence of the collections, and sometimes your alumni are your best stewards and advocates. And just as an example, these are some of the governance stakeholders at any rate, they will be different stakeholders at your institutions, although many will be uh, similar in kind of makeup. So this would include, for in our case, the University Senate, we have faculty counselors on our board of trustees, we have an Emory Alumni Board, and the Student Government Association. And um, I was fortunate because I had worked with all these organizations previously and was able to bring them into the Rose Library, kind of physically into the Rose Library, or um, bring our resources and materials to them. And they became you know, tremendous advocates, and the special collections there are a great source of pride to the entire university. And so under the heading of advocacy, I'm really recommending that you find both very natural, such as um, history professors, um, who would ordinarily be interested, or literary professors. Um, those are kind of the natural ones, and then some of them, of course, like to go to happy hours at breweries, too. <laughs> um, but also, and this should be a natural, natural for McGill science faculty who may be collectors, board members who love history, students who seek internships, alumni who wish to volunteer. I also engaged our um, Emory students who are the campus ambassadors who lead the admissions tours on campus where we have the you know, annual spring migration every year. And so they all mention, they, they have gotten an orientation to the Rose Library, and they all mention the Rose Library. And they are very proud uh, that we have it in their collect our collections and perhaps some of the courses that they've uh, taken therein. And then invite the broader community to think tank, 
discussions, such as discussions such as this, and make connections with related and seemingly unrelated departments and organizations. And um, I have found that there's nobody in the Emory community that has said to me, at least, that they are wondering, like, why is Emory investing in this? Most people say, wow, this is really interesting. And uh, I wonder if there's something there that relates to my own family history or my own project or something my grandmother might have been participating in. And then we all have to be prepared to tell a story about your place, then tell it again, and then tell it in a new way, uh, but with clear, consistent, and aspirational messaging. So we went through a period, oh, before I go there, um, investment, uh, you, you, in any kind of investment you want a diverse portfolio, so that may not be specifically your special collections, it could be, they're typically diverse, both by choice and randomly, but also your constituent parties, um, groups that would be drawn to it. You want a wide range of people and a wide range of programming, exhibitions, classes, and in terms of how to develop a larger profile, you can grow deeply locally, I would suggest, in, in your community and in your city, in your place where you are, and then go global with that because it will extend beyond your own boundaries in ways that you don't even know where it's going. As international visitors come, as faculty speak on your behalf. <clears throat> So um, my job was transforming Marvel, which, which was what we were then called, Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library. And we did a major renovation. And um, in that process, we had to relocate. And then we also had to rediscover what we had. Um, this is the room that we actually used for our classroom. In this particular case, that it's the architectural rendering. They were thinking of it more like a lecture space. But in fact, it's more frequently set up as we've seen in other places as a workshop space with movable tables and areas for students to, to gather, to talk, to learn. And we've taught in the past two years over 150 mostly undergraduate classes in this space. So it's been really transformational. And those classes range from public health to art history to English to religion to sociology, you name it. And I would say that we, in addition to having dance and theater in the Rose Library, we've also had punk rock, so. <laughs> um, one of the first things we did was to rewrite, restate our mission statement. Um, this went along with the, the raising, um, which was, I, I was heavily involved with the naming gift from Stuart Rose, and so we uh, rewrote our mission statement. And mostly what I want to um, point out here is the collecting and connecting stories of human experience, promoting access and learning, and offering opportunities for dialogue for all wise hearts who seek knowledge. And that is the Emory mantra. Um, it's an essential part of our culture, and that is it is a place for all wise hearts who seek knowledge. So in incorporating that into our mission statement and then in the ways that all of you are doing by um, distinctive collections, original research, bridging content and context through innovative programming and exhibitions and the like. Um, we also just tried to distill what our major areas of focus would be in under collecting stories, so literature and poetry being among them. And this is an instance of uh, of being both local and global, it turns out that Salman Rushdie, um, who spent quite a bit of time on our campus, has a deep interest in Flannery O'Connor. So we took a road trip together to Milledgeville, Georgia, and we stopped at Eatonton, Georgia, where Alice Walker is from on the way back. So all of these, um, these materials, some of which you wouldn't expect to be in conversation with one another, are actually in conversation. And then another area of strength for us is African American history and culture. And these areas overlap in very significant ways. And I'll talk a little bit about our SCLC collection in just a second. A third area of strength for us is collecting stories, Southern historical and political. Bobby Jones was a graduate of Emory, so there's a lot of interest in him. Uh, the mayor of Emory, and the gentleman in the middle is uh, Dr. Jesse Peel, who helped us initiate our 
growing um, LGBT collection and um, has served to endow many of um, the efforts associated with that. So it's, it continues to grow in ever new ways. And um, uh, rare books, of course, is central to our collections and connect with all the collecting areas I just mentioned, along with our university archives, which we have been able to use in many of the ways that Tim has also described. So those are kind of the key elements and clarity about what we have in our collection. And I, can, I also have slides now with me today about how, how those overlap and intersect with one another. Um, this was the SCLC collection. Um, and so we also like to be able to make the point of like, what do, what do you actually do? Or, you know, why is it important? Or, you know, you can, I could never let you in my basement because, you know, it would just be a disaster scene. But, well, yeah, we've seen disaster scenes and this is what it looked like. And this is what it turned into. And so, you know, that tells a story in and of itself, and then people say, well, you know, I knew where it was in the basement, but uh, I can't find it now. And so then we're able to share with them how we are able to promote access and learning through our finding aids. Um, and also, this is uh, Dr. Carol Anderson, who wrote the um, you know, groundbreaking book, White Rage. And she is teaching here um, in our teaching learning studio from the SCLC collection. So you see how all of these areas connect and how Emory faculty and students as well as outside donors such as the LC, uh, SCLC collection and the, the, the leaders of that have been engaged in this effort. Um, on the right hand side standing up is Gabrielle Dudley. She is our instructional archivist and she pulls together our teaching program and is involved in a university-wide effort. Emory um, made as its theme for accreditation, for our accreditation, the Sachs Review, each university has to choose a theme. Our theme was the, the theme of the nature of evidence. And so she is involved in that university-wide initiative on the nature of evidence and then um, that it has helped grow our instructional program. And it's also led to many student-driven exhibitions as well. Okay. We're a big believer, as you all are, in engaging, engaging diverse audiences. And these are just some of the diverse audiences we engage uh, around our collections. Again, people looking at SCLC, uh, Billups Hatch collection, you know, students using us for history projects, and yes, the Tibetan Buddhist monks are, are regulars on the Emory campus and also are very involved in our collections. So that's just a few of the audiences that we reach out to. And then what I recommend is for myself, I was always seeking, you know, areas of my own interest that and research and work that intersect with those of the Rose Library. And so I happened to write a paper and do a presentation that was on the similarities between, believe it or not, Jack Kerouac and Flannery O'Connor. Um, and so it, it, there were, um, they both lived very short lives. They both were heavily influenced by Catholicism. They both saw themselves as artists as well as writers. And they were both very meticulous in their style of writing. And they lived in almost the exact same period of time for their lives. So all of that is to say that students, faculty, visitors, researchers can find, can find a conversation that develops within the library itself that perhaps we would not have thought of before, but just came to me one day because we had acquired both some Kerouac papers and the papers of Flannery O'Connor within the same period of time. Um, and so that opportunity then that exists for discovery. And in that kind of conversation, you bring in people from all different kinds of audiences. And so our, our the Rose Library, I guess I should say, future directions are on this research, teaching, and learning focus, the community outreach, and partnerships. And in so doing, we've been able to bring in people such as Stuart Rose, who is an alum of Emory University, who is a private collector and a true believer in the mission of the university. And since his engagement um, with us, 
Um, he's now a member of the Board of Trustees for Emory University, so he can also speak on our behalf at various um, conversations and um, various convergences that unfold in new ways for us. So thank you very much.